medcram.com. Well, welcome to another MedCram COVID-19 update. We're going to talk about excess deaths today. This reminded me of something way back at the beginning of the pandemic that we had forgotten about. This article reminded me, this is an article that goes back to May 4th of 2020. It's titled, Excess Deaths, People Who Are Dying Because of COVID-19, But Not From It. And even at that time, we were talking about excess deaths. And the article goes on to say that a recent poll from the American College of Emergency Physicians reported that 29% of Americans are avoiding or delaying medical care due to fear of contracting the new coronavirus, SARS-CoV-2. And in fact, what they noted at the time was from March 1st to April 4th, 2020, there was 8,128 COVID-related deaths reported on death certificates, but excess deaths accounted for nearly two times that amount for the same period. And I can remember that because if you will recall, hospitals were shut down. The most revenue generating portions of the hospital, like the operating room where they were doing hip replacements and elective surgeries was completely shut down and none of that was happening. But also other diagnostic things, for instance, like breast cancer screenings and colonoscopies, all of these things that were done to check for cancers were not being done at that time. And it took a long time for those things to start getting back into full swing. The other thing that we started to see that was really interesting, too, is that normally people, when they have right lower quadrant pain and they have appendicitis, they'll come in and get checked out. They were delaying that. They were not coming in, and we were seeing quite a lot of perfed appies. And so while you would never see in the diagnosis on this patient, because they didn't have COVID-19, they didn't die of COVID-19, It was the ripple effects of COVID-19 that were causing disruptions. Why? Because all of this was ending up in the hospital. And in one part of the hospital, we were dealing with a pandemic. And in another part of the hospital, they couldn't get the things done that they needed to get done. This was also happening in primary care offices all across the country, not just in the United States, but in fact, all over the world. So what I want to do today is look at what's happened over the last couple of years and look at some data that's really quite telling and from the 30,000 foot level, retrace our steps about where we are, and then tackle this question about excess deaths. What are they? Is there really a COVID excess death and a non-COVID excess death? And from those non-COVID excess deaths, what can you really attribute them to? And really, what's in that category? And I think this will be really educational, and I hope this video really makes the rounds and gets shared because I think there's a lot of very important information, particularly in this video. I think in all of our videos, we give some really good information, but I think this one particularly could refocus people on what's important in terms of health screening and getting back into seeing a healthcare provider. So let's get started. But first, who am I? I'm a pulmonary and critical care sleep specialist. I'm boarded in internal medicine, pulmonary diseases, sleep medicine, critical care medicine. I'm a professor at two Southern California medical schools. We have an online education company called MedCram where we upload educational videos for healthcare providers. And we have CME, that means continuing medical education credits that go along with it. So we educate healthcare providers. And our content is used by a lot of organizations, including publishers. And pharmaceutical companies are not paying us to make this content. So before we get into the data, this was another piece of research that I saw that was really important. 50% of U.S. adults did not receive information about COVID-19 or the vaccine from their doctor. And this was published on August 10th, 2021. And the key findings of this study were that 50% of respondents have higher expectations for their doctors since COVID-19. 40% of respondents do not receive communication from their doctor between visits. 23% say their opinion of their doctor has changed since COVID-19. And nearly 20% of respondents are considering changing their doctor based on how they handled COVID-19. Here's the part that gave me a little bit of pause. For the 41% of doctors who lost the confidence of their patients, it was their lack of communication about COVID-19, 53%, their slow adoption of virtual care, 29%, and their underutilization of digital communication tools, 24%, that impacted their reputation. I think it's high time that we in the medical field start to wake up and realize that we have companies like Amazon and Facebook and your bank that are now saying, hey, we can do the stuff that we used to do in person online. And what's happened is whether there's trust issues or whether patients are afraid of getting infected in the office, 
they're just not coming in. And we have had some real issues getting patients the care that they need because there's certain things that we do as physicians, especially primary care physicians and people who do screening, that you actually have to be there for us to screen you for bad things like cancer. And so what's the effect of that? What has happened since COVID? It's not directly the virus causing the issue. It's the ripple effects of this. So this is what I did. I made these three graphs, and basically I got all of this data from our world in data, and you can do the very same thing as I have just done here by taking the data and copying it and pasting it and stretching it to have the dates match up, and that's exactly what we've done here. I've done this one for the United States. The first graph is up here. You can't really see it very well, but there is a line right here as the baseline. That's important to know because this first graph here is simply the graph of daily SARS-CoV-2 infections. In other words, how many people on a daily basis got infected with SARS-CoV-2? And you can see here that there's a little bit of a bump here, there's a little bit of a bump here, and then we have our first triple wave little bumps there, and then it goes on. And that was our first wave that we had in December of 2020 and January of 2021. So these are infections. That's key to know. This is United States, so USA. And then I superimposed it here at the bottom with excess mortality. So this is total excess mortality. This is COVID. This is non-COVID. This is very specific data. Okay, this is not a random sampling. This is solid data on excess mortality. We know how many people die at certain times of the year, every year. So when somebody dies, they're either at the hospital or they're at home or they're out in the field. A coroner comes, they take the body, they generate a death certificate. You can't bury the person without a death certificate. And so we're just talking about who has a death certificate, how many death certificates came in. That's a very specific raw number. We don't have to do a study to figure that out. We can actually number them. So these numbers here are very solid. When we look at excess mortality, those are solid numbers. There's really no wiggle room. Infections, yeah. I mean, you can underestimate infections, especially here at the beginning when we didn't have a lot of testing. But nevertheless, we have the number of infections. And then what I did was I looked at the daily vaccine doses. So these aren't people, but these are doses. And I couldn't figure out a way to superimpose this data on top of this, but I stretched it out and I made it so that it was exactly the same in magnitude and amplitude as this one. So 1 million is about that much. This up here in this first graph is the number of infections on a daily basis that were measured in this country specifically. And here, there was a period of time through the pandemic when we all of a sudden had vaccines available, and that's right here at this line right here. And I inverted it, so at the top is zero, and we have one million, two million, three million. There was a period there where we vaccinated three and a half million people in one day. Let me repeat that again. We vaccinated three and a half million people in one day either gave them their first shot or they gave them their second shot. So I'm looking at this data here. This is vaccinations. Here, this is infections. And they are scaled. So literally what's going on here versus what's going on here. And the first thing that you can see, I don't know if you've realized this, but the most we were having at this time was like 300,000 people getting COVID on a daily basis. And around at that same time, we were getting three and a half million so 10 times the number of vaccines were being passed out at this particular point of the pandemic than people were getting infections. Here, during the Omicron wave, for what it's worth, we had at least a million people a day getting infected. So I superimposed it on excess mortality here. And what I wanted to look at here was, let's just get this big picture. Let's see what's actually going on here with infections. So first thing I want you to draw your attention to is excess mortality. Notice here, before we really had our first big wave, early on in January, when things had shut down, we had this huge peak of excess mortality. I don't know exactly why that is, but there's a couple of suggestions. Number one, lack of testing. Could have had a much bigger wave here, and that could be the reason. Could also be from the shutdown. So let's face it, you can't go to your appointments. You can't go to the hospital as easily. You're afraid to go to the hospital. Something happens, and you're not going to get diagnosed if it's an acute issue. So all of those are potential reasons for a huge excess mortality at this time of year. Again, this is all types of excess mortality. This could be COVID, this could be non-COVID, this could be appendicitis, this could be, you name it, doesn't matter. It's just that for some reason at this point in time, that this year, based on previous years, we had way more deaths than we would normally have expected.
I tend to think here that it's probably because we had more COVID going on than we thought because we didn't have adequate testing at that time. We really didn't know it. And the reason why I say that is because notice that there's a little bump there in the testing that we did have. And here's a big bump there. Also notice a little bump there translates into a little bump there, probably a little hiccup. Where we actually started to get a lot of testing was at this point here. This is the first wave that we really had. You may remember this. It was kind of a triple bump, one, two, and three. And notice here, we kind of see that triple bump here, one, two, and three. Notice that it's a little bit delayed because the infection comes on first. And then about seven days later, patients ended up in the intensive care unit. And here we have our excess mortality. We have not entered into the phase yet of vaccines, but there is excess mortality. And it seems to be driven at least temporarily by temporarily, I mean in terms of time, that these things are driving excess mortality. And specifically, this excess mortality right here that we see is completely driven by these infections, specifically these SARS-CoV-2 infections, and also the other things that we mentioned before, like people not getting access to healthcare, et cetera, et cetera, because when these waves are coming on, the hospitals are not able to deal with other issues. So if a patient is in the hospital and they're being bogged down by excessive SARS-CoV-2 patients in the intensive care unit, you're going to be pulling resources to other places. Perhaps people coming in with other issues are not going to be attended to as well. And so you'll have on their death certificates, maybe something else that's listed, or maybe it'll be COVID, depending on what they're dying of. And nevertheless, this causes a bottleneck, and then we see excess deaths. Now, we enter into the situation where vaccines are starting to become available, and that was in December of 2020. You can see it down here. We have January of 2020. We have August of 2020. We have February of 2021, September of 2021, August of 2022. And then we basically have this campaign where we are vaccinating healthcare workers who are high risk and also the elderly. At first, it was those that were greater than 75, and then 65, and then started making its way down. And this is this rapid increase. I have it flipped around here. So going down is actually going up to this peak at this point. Now notice here that excess mortality starts to decrease. I am in no way thinking that because of this vaccine campaign, that is the reason necessarily for the excess deaths coming down. If you notice here that excess deaths come down on their own, even before there were vaccines, that's just the natural history of these surges. They go up when they want and they come down when they want. Nevertheless, notice here that we have 300,000 infections that incontestably are driving this increase in excess mortality. It's certainly not vaccination. The question is, is there a signal coming from this vaccination drive? I mean, we just vaccinated three and a half million people in one day and we've had a huge spike leading up to it. Certainly, if there was a noticeable vaccine attributable spike in excess deaths, this is the place where we should see it. The purpose of this analysis is not to say that there are no vaccine-associated excess mortality. Certainly, this analysis is not going to show that because you need to break it down and do much more detailed research. Again, the purpose of this analysis is to look at the 30,000-foot view to see what the magnitude of these things might be. You, in fact, would need to, first of all, sort out all of the COVID-related excess mortality and look at non-COVID excess mortality. But we'll talk a little bit more about that later because even non-COVID excess mortality has its challenges. But what we see here is we see a persistently elevated excess mortality. And if we look up here, we see that there is a persistently elevated excess mortality even up here as well. But we don't see a spike of excess mortality here, at least initially, leading us to believe here that if there is an excess mortality from this huge increase in vaccinations, at least acutely, it is buried somewhere in this data here. Next, we go to the Delta wave. And as you may recall, this was in the summer of 2021. We never really reached a zero. It sort of went down, stayed slightly elevated, and then went back up again. And that's what we saw with excess deaths as well. And it was during this time that there was quite a bit of a pullback in terms of those that were getting vaccinated, as you can see here. Quite a bit of a pullback. There was some what they called vaccine hesitancy. And this was not homogeneous across the country, but actually it was distributed unevenly in certain states. 
This was an unfortunate event because the hospitals were overrun by a lot of COVID-19 patients. And in fact, the states and their governors had to implement crisis protocols so that when patients came to the hospital and they did not have resources, they would have to know exactly on what basis would they select which patients would get which treatment. I remember that even here in California where I practice, we had to submit to the state government are a priori protocols so that when we reach the situation when we, for instance, ran out of ventilators or ran out of medication or didn't have a hemodialysis nurse or hemodialysis, exactly how were we going to choose which patients we were going to treat? Unfortunately, at my hospital in California, we did not have to execute that, but there were a number of hospitals where that actually occurred in other states. And I'll just pick one at random just to highlight it. For instance, in Idaho, which was 47th on the list of states in terms of vaccination, they had a 55.4% vaccination rate recently. I don't know exactly what it was at that time, but it was around the same in terms of the ranking. And if you look here at the timeline for what happened in Idaho on September 6th, 2021, which was during the Delta surge, the CSC, which was the protocol for the crisis management, was activated in the Panhandle Health District in northern Idaho. On September 16th, that was expanded to the entire state. On November 22nd, it was deactivated in all but the Panhandle Health District, and that was because things were starting to cool down, the Delta wave was wearing off. On December 20th, it was deactivated in the Panhandle Health District, and then by that point, we started to see Omicron, and then in Omicron, CSC was activated in the Southwest District Health, the Central District Health, and the South Central District Health in Southern Idaho. You can see here for the Centers of Medicare and Medicaid, their mandates for vaccination at health facilities where CMS was employed. And you can see here that in the state of Idaho, which was a dark blue, that their phase one was February 14th, 2022, and their phase two was March 15th, 2022, meaning that the first shot of the vaccine would have to be given before February 14th and the second before March 15th, unless, of course, there was testing or they got a religious exemption. These deadlines were in 2022, and these issues of crisis were months before that. This was a demand issue and not a supply issue. So going back to our graph, we can see here that with the Delta wave, again, exactly as we predict temporarily, there was a maybe one to two week delay, but we saw a peak in excess deaths once again. And notice that with the Delta wave, there was renewed interest in getting vaccinated. So vaccinations started to go up again. But notice that infections did not come back down. They stayed at an increased level, and the total excess mortality remained up. And then finally, we went for this Omicron wave, which was extremely elevated. This was like a million cases a day. Interestingly, though, even though there was such a discrepancy between the height of the infection here, there wasn't a big difference between these excess mortality peaks. This led some to suggest that the Omicron variant was less virulent maybe causing less hospitalization. And that's certainly a possibility. It could also mean that there was a number of more people that were now immune to this, either through vaccination or natural immunity from prior infections. Notice again that we had a almost complete normalization of infections shortly after this very large wave, which would also seem to indicate that perhaps infection was causing some immunity. But then as the infection started to go back up again, we started to see excess mortality go up and then stay stable at this point. The excess mortality was highest right before vaccination was introduced and never again went that high. But if you look at infections, there is a very specific and very definite temporal association between when the waves hit and when excess mortality hits. However, we don't see that with the huge drive in vaccinations. Here in the short term, we did not see any excess deaths whatsoever. And again, excess mortality are very definite, specific numbers. This is not a sampling of a population. We know the actual number because we know how many people have died before the pandemic, and we know how many people are dying in exact numbers now, and we know what that difference is. These are not projected. These are absolutes. And we know that after a massive campaign of vaccination, there really was no substantial corresponding spike in excess deaths after the vaccine.
Now, one could say that, well, maybe this would happen later on. Maybe the vaccine was putting into motion biological factors that would only present months down the road, let's say four, five, six months later. In fact, it could be said potentially that this increase right here of excess deaths may be non-COVID and could be related to this spike here, which would look at around perhaps six to seven months. But if we take the same six to seven months and project it out this far, we don't see any sort of increase in excess mortality here at this point, even though there is a spike of vaccinations at this point as well. The point of this analysis is to show that currently in the United States, our excess mortality is very close to baseline. And if we want to look from the 30,000 foot level about how much excess mortality is going on in the United States, it's actually fairly low compared to other countries that have also gotten the vaccines. And so it would seem that that variation between, for instance, us and Great Britain can't really be explained by vaccination since we both used very similar vaccines, specifically the mRNA vaccines. In this country, we did not use the AstraZeneca, but we did use the Johnson & Johnson, which is a similar platform. Again, this is not saying that there are no excess mortality deaths from the vaccine. I would say it would be very unusual that there's an intervention that has no risk. I mean, every medical intervention that I am aware of always has risk, and I would think that a vaccine is no different. But it's good to put it into proportion here in this situation. To be able to look at that, of course, you would have to subtract out COVID deaths from non-COVID deaths in terms of excess deaths and see what is it that is contributing to those. The tricky part, though, is determining, is a non-COVID death a death that does not result directly from COVID, but could it be from the COVID pandemic itself? And I think that's really the key that we need to look at. Why do countries still at this point have excess deaths? And why are they so different in terms of countries that have used COVID-19 vaccines? This speaks to what we were talking about at the beginning. This was data that was looked at at the very beginning of the pandemic. You can see here that this was published back in September of 2020 in the journal Oncology, which is a very prestigious journal. In the UK, when they did their surveys and they did the research, they found that, for instance, during the pandemic at the beginning, breast cancer screenings dropped by a dramatic 89%. If you're not doing breast cancer screenings, you can't catch the breast cancers early enough. And as a result of that, they are discovered much later and therefore they're much more likely to cause death. A massive drop of 84.5%. Overall cancer diagnosis, I mean, the actual diagnosis that were made, for instance, in April of 2020, 65% drop. Folks, that's huge. That's massive. Melanoma. 67% drop in the diagnosis of melanoma. Lung cancer, almost a 50% drop. And this is UK data. And because of this, they predicted a almost 8 to 9% increase in breast cancer deaths in the UK and a 48 to 5.3% lung cancer deaths in the UK. That's interesting. If somebody doesn't get their screening during the COVID pandemic and they don't want to go in, or perhaps they've lost trust in their physician, and they get cancer as a result of that, that's a non-COVID excess death. That's a death that would not have happened if it wasn't for COVID and certainly wouldn't have happened in previous years because people were actually getting their cancer screening. This is a huge portion of the non-COVID excess deaths. What about those people that were depressed? What about those people that were shut down? What about those people that lost loved ones and they committed suicide? All of those have to squeeze under that small area of non-COVID deaths. Let's take a look at that graph again. We're looking right here. What has to fit under that small area of excess mortality? First of all, it's all of the COVID deaths have to fit under there. And all of the non-COVID excess deaths have to fit under there. All of the people that got depressed from COVID, all of the people that are not exercising because of COVID, all the people that got diabetes and died as a result of COVID, all the people that missed their appointments, all the people that didn't get cancer screening, all of it has to fit under here. Whereas Delta Wave caused all of this. We put it into proportion for you so you can understand in terms of amplitude, the cause of excess mortality in the country that you're living in. All right, what about the United States? Here's a survey that was done. 39% of adults over 55 who had cancer screening during COVID-19 pandemic missed it, survey find. So certainly we are not free from that either. But 
There's a big difference between 89% and 65% and just 39%. We're seeing twice as much missing of very important screening for cancer in the UK and half as much, but still there, half as much in the United States. Now, I'm not saying that this is the reason for it, but I find it really interesting that early on in the pandemic, the excess deaths were pretty much the same, as you might imagine, between the United Kingdom in green and the United States in red. And then even here, the United States had a higher excess mortality during Delta. This one's Delta and this one's Omicron for whatever reasons, and it has to do with epidemiological, has to do with how things spread around the country and when the surges were and all of that. But now that the surges are over, at least for now, and we're looking at baseline, we're just looking at just kind of the baseline trends as things are kind of evening out, notice that the United Kingdom and the United States, there's a difference in excess mortality baselines now. And one has to wonder if their hens are coming home to roost from missed opportunities back here for cancer screening now presenting itself here at this point. Because it would be very difficult to say that the increase in excess deaths in the United Kingdom is due to vaccines when the vaccines were the same used in the UK as they are in the United States. So why would that be any different? Why does the UK have a higher excess mortality? more study needs to be done on this, but it may be related to phenomenal increase in missed appointments for screening of these types of diagnoses, if this data that we present here is correct. So we know that vaccines themselves can cause problems. Like we said, every medical intervention ever invented has always had a risk factor. And one of the big risk factors that have been discussed for the mRNA vaccines, of course, is myocarditis. Well, this was published in The Lancet, and particularly in children and adolescents, those are the ones that were most susceptible to getting myocarditis. Could that be driving some of this? Well, this was just published a few weeks ago in an article titled Outcomes of at least 90 Days Since Onset of Myocarditis After mRNA COVID-19 Vaccination in Adolescents and Young Adults in the USA, a follow-up surveillance study. So this was published in The Lancet, which is a British journal. They say, quote, between August 24, 2021 and January 12, 2022, we collected data for 519 of 836 eligible patients who were at least 90 days post myocarditis onset, 126 patients via patient survey only, 162 patients via healthcare provider survey only, and 231 patients via both surveys. What did they find? Quote, most patients had improvements in cardiac diagnostic marker and testing data at follow-up, including normal or back-to-baseline troponin concentrations. They had 91% of patients with available data. Echocardiograms were back to normal in 94%, electrocardiograms in 77%, exercise stress testing in 90%, and ambulatory rhythm monitoring in 90% of the patients that got myocarditis. So it seems as though there's a high propensity of recovery in a risk from the COVID-19 vaccine that is not very common. But of course, more data needs to come in, and I think this is important. We want to know what the risks are of everything. So I applaud those that are doing the studies and looking into this so we can find out more. I think that's the key, is to always have an open discussion about risks. That's a very good discussion in terms of where we are right now. So clearly, you can see here, we have not had another wave. And so the question is, is where we are right now as a society with this excess mortality and the number of people that have had infections and have been vaccinated have very little in terms of infections at this point. We haven't gone through winter, so we'll have to reserve our judgment. But is the need for vaccines back here the same as it is here? I think that's a valid discussion to have at this point, given the apparent lack of virility or lack of ability to put patients in the hospital with COVID-19. So the jury is still out on that, and it's quite relevant and appropriate to have that open discussion about what we should be doing at this point in the pandemic got to look at all of the data and come up with risks and benefits. And for those who are interested, there was a study that we reviewed a number of months ago on a MedCram video called Vaccines Versus Mortality. It looked at seven different integrated systems in the United States, like Kaiser, looking at non-COVID excess mortality and in conjunction with vaccination. So we'll put a link in the description below.
So that's what I wanted to show you. I'd really like to get constructive feedback. One of the things here that I really learned from this was when I stacked up the amount of vaccination in the same scale as the number of infections. Clearly, we can see here that the excess mortality that we see in the United States seems to be much more driven by the infections of SARS-CoV-2 than the vaccinations for COVID-19 SARS-CoV-2 in this situation. I think this graph really brings out that illustration. The other thing that I think is really interesting is that if there is a excess mortality from vaccination, then it should be in this area right here. And you can see that that represents a ceiling and under that ceiling has to fit all of the non-COVID and COVID mortality data. So in other words, we have to extract out of that all of the mortality from COVID, which we can still see here, there were infections at this point. We have to take out of there all of the depression, all of the people that didn't get testing and screening for cancers and things of that nature. And only then when that is left, you will have the amount for a potential, if any, excess death from COVID-19 vaccines. And I think that information is very important. So we're here right now and we need to come up with ideas about what we should do going forward, especially this winter with the flu season coming on and perhaps another wave. As we've talked about before, the sun is really important. And as the sun starts to set earlier and earlier in the day and we get less and less of that sunshine, we're going to be more susceptible to getting these types of viruses. And again, it's possible that this excess mortality could be due to the fact that many people have not gotten their cancer screenings. This pandemic has disrupted a lot of people's lives. They have not gone back to see their physicians. And it's important that those screenings be done if we're going to pick up those cancers that could cause excess deaths. It may even be people who have been diagnosed but have not been able to go back and get the necessary tests before resolution of the cancer, whether it be surgery or radiation, can be done. So I highly encourage everyone to go back to their physicians if they're supposed to be getting screening and get those things done because that's really important. So I thank you for joining us. If you'd like more information about this and other topics, for instance, like EKG, COPD, asthma, congestive heart failure, and sleep apnea, don't forget to visit us at medcram.com. Thanks for joining us.